All right, new episode of Young and Naive. Um, who are you? I'm Branko Milanovic. I work on income distribution, generally, like globally speaking, but obviously I'm interested in individual countries. Mm-hmm. I'm especially interested most recently, in, well, recently meaning last like 10, 12 years in China, Chinese inequality, corruption, and uh, my book, Capitalism, Comma, Alone, deals essentially with the U.S. as a liberal capitalist uh, country and China as what they call political capitalism. So what do you do here and where are we here? We are now outside of Berlin. We are in a very beautiful place. Uh, we are actually lucky that the rain has stopped so we can actually sit outside. Well, was it raining? It was raining this morning oh. and it's, uh, it's quite beautiful and uh, we are just uh, here for a conference which deal, which actually, the question being, how can we bring the people back? Meaning, how are they going to vote for the parties that we like? But I think the motto is winning back the people. That suggests to me that there was one point where you guys had won the people? Well, yes. In, When was that? When was that? <laughs> Implicitly, there was a moment, or maybe there was a period, actually. I don't know what they exactly have in mind. They probably they have in mind uh, not from 1960s to 1990s, approximately, or maybe even to 2000. You know, may, maybe the, the, you know, the financial crisis 2006 was maybe in some ways a turning point. Mm. So, uh, the, 2007, sorry. And uh, the summit here consists mostly of economists, right? I would say actually maybe entirely of the economists or maybe a few political scientists, but certainly not sociologists, anthropologists, ethnographers. So it's a very sort of uh, economics oriented. And then you can imagine it is obviously the using economics to tell us what really went wrong so that people that were apparently voting in the right way mm. stopped voting. So, um, in Germany, most of the leading economists are neoliberal or neoclassical uh, economists. Are you one of them as well? Well, in some sense, I'm neoclassical, but... For example, in my new book that was the deals it's called the visions of inequality, and you know it looks at different authors starting with Kennedy and going to Adam Smith, Marx, and so forth until Kuznets about how they looked at, at the inequality uh, I take a very negative and very critical view in the last chapter on how neoclassical economics has treated inequality or actually did not treat inequality until maybe the last 10 years. Now, of course, as you know, for younger people, it is sort of obvious that inequality is a big topic because you can read about that, you see it in the news, on TV, your own channel and all that. But, uh, you know, in 1970s, 1980s, it was just a topic that would not get, would, would get you nowhere if you were to study it. Why? Well, but, I mean, yeah. hasn't inequality been around uh, yes. for all of mankind? Isn't that like a natural phenomenon? Right, there's, but, but there's, no, there's nothing no. we can do, right? No, no, no. We, we can do lots of things. But what when I say inequality was, of course, around. But the you know the distinct, distinction is not between inequality and equality. So they are not binary things. Mm-hmm. The question is actually, do people feel that inequality is too high? Now, why were not studies of inequality more common and popular in the, let's suppose, at the peak of neoclassical influence towards the end of the last century? Mm -hmm. And my answer is threefold, okay? Like, the first part is due to a change in the neoclassical economics, which basically started treating everybody as an agent. So you are wealthy and I'm poor, but we are basically the same because you work within your constraints, I work within my constraints. Mm. You have capital, I have labor. They started actually ignoring that really important cleavage. And again, saying, okay, you've got an asset that is called capital, I've got an asset that is called labor, we are the same. So that was one reason. The second reason was for political reasons, I think, especially in the U.S., you really were discouraged to talk about class distinctions. And that means that you really cannot talk much about capital income. So capital income was basically sort of chased out of economics. 
or neoclassical economics. And the third one is funding of research by the rich. So I had actually three explanations for that, what I call, uh, the chapter is called the eclipse. Mm -hmm. So it was not studied much, or if it was studied, it was studied only from the labor point of view, you know, higher returns to more educated labor and so on. But, you know, that does not really, uh, it is not the gist of, of really inequality economics because they really have to deal with cleavages. It could be race, it could be gender, it could be class. They cannot just deal with labor income. So uh, I was quite surprised that you said like they, the neoclasses, they, they treated labor and capital as the, basically the same? They like, yeah, they try to ignore the difference. They really, essentially, they try to ignore the difference because once you accept that difference as very important difference in the way that you have acquired income, but also in the distribution, you know, the capital income is still very heavily uh, skewed and received by the rich. But if you try to minimize that difference and say, okay, these are just different types of assets, labor power versus capital, you essentially, you, you disregard it. You minimize it, and I think that's what they did. But they, they made the choice to disregard. Yes, they Why? made. They made. I think it is really essentially political choice because it was really. Uh, I mean, to put it bluntly, very bluntly, it's essentially was what they call Cold War economics. So if the Soviet Union claimed that they had no classes because they got rid of capitalists because they nationalized everything, mm -hmm. uh, the, the U.S. also claimed, look, we really don't have class distinctions in this country because everybody can become rich. So really making the distinctions and insisting that there is a fundamental difference between capital income and labor income is kind of, you know, in creating class struggle and strife, and it's really not desirable. So because they didn't want to have classes, they said there are no classes. Yeah, basically, yeah, basically. But of course, as I said, you can also make it put it more nicely by saying there is a model where there are you know different agents they, they own different things but basically i think it was a political choice but like neoclasses i mean i had many on they consider them, some themselves scientists how can a scientist choose to ignore something well they would not ignore it in the sense that they would just say okay that doesn't exist but they would not study it sufficiently and it would not be included and incorporated in the studies i mean just to give you it is it is a fact uh, until Until late 20th century and early the first decade of the 21st century, um, incomes from capital and wealth inequality were not really integrated nor studied very much. Mm -hmm. And a, uh, the importance of Piketty there really is, is quite big in the sense that he brought capital before him, Tony Atkinson, they brought capital back into the mainstream of inequality studies and hence also in the mainstream of, of neoclassical studies. But whether economists or scientists, well, you know, this is of course a very difficult matter because obviously people do, do say that, but there is also an element of, uh, how should I say, of um, intuition, art, skill, Uh, in economics. I mean, Keynes made this point, you know, it's not only that uh, it, economics is not like astronomy, you know, I don't think it is. More like astrology? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's a combination of astrology and astronomy. <laughs> We're going to talk about inequality later. Uh, explain to our uh, viewers and listeners, why did you become an economist? I became, I thought you were going to ask me why I did I study inequality and actually yeah, I could, gonna, I could give you a good answer to that. come to that. No, I, I'll give you a, a, an answer that I always give. But why did I study economy? That, that's actually, that's a good, more difficult question. I was quite interested in social issues, partly because I sort of grew up being on the left And partly because it was the you know the time of decolonization and the war in Vietnam, they both sort of um, sort of how should they say influence you. Mm -hmm. And coming from Yugoslavia, which was then non-aligned, it had two influences. First, uh, much greater interest in other continents than than Europe. Mm -hmm. so for, secondly, I thought that even Yugoslav policy with regard to the Vietnam War was not strong enough. Uh, 
And that was not direct answer, but I want to say I actually came from the interest in social sciences and even philosophy. So when I really had to decide over thinking whether I should do philosophy, of course, my parents were not excited with the idea of studying philosophy oh. because you can, cannot get a job, you know, with philosophy. So Even, even back then, right? No, it was like, a, it really... Generally speaking, was well. Obviously, you had guys who would be, become professors and so on. But obviously, the demand for philosophers is small, and so economics was really chosen by me as a sort of a, a, a usable philosophy, philosophy out of which you can make money. <laughs> so you were born in Belgrade in, in the early early fifties. Um, Yugoslavia yeah. was non-aligned, but they right. were they were like socialist. They were socialist. Socialist they were, dictatorship. Uh, Well, dictatorship is a big word, actually. It, the first time that I heard the word dictatorship applied to Tito was was probably when I, much later in like, a, you know, it, 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 it is an authoritarian regime. But authoritarianism is different from dictatorship. What's the difference? Well, dictatorship is tougher. A dictatorship puts more people in jail. Dictatorship has more... Uh, prevalent uh, secret services, uh, controls the language and publications, I think, much, much more. Authoritarian regime essentially does that, all of that, but I think at a smaller scale. And the author authoritarian regimes, and particularly, for instance, in Yugoslavia, where you had the personality cult, is essentially, um, how should I say, uh, defending that person. So you couldn't say really uh, negative things about Tito, but you could actually discuss many other subjects quite freely. So that would, I would say, there is a difference between the two. Uh, I'm from former East Germany, uh, GDR, yeah. and back home you always knew when to make jokes about the, the leaders and right. when not to make jokes. Right. Uh, how was it at home with you and Tito. Well, it it was the same actually. I think it was very similar in that respect. And of course, you knew, you learned that. It's interesting how you learn it. I don't know if there are studies of kids, but um, it's not that the, your parents told you what you should say or what you should not say. Be careful, Branko, when you're at school or something. N they would not. You would actually sort of learn that by osmosis, by socialization. Mm. And you know, let me tell you, it is not so different from what we are now having when you have to learn how to address people how to use the gender, how to, you know, it, it is similar. It's actually nobody, oh. nobody uh, they don't have to tell you, no, look, if, if uh, this woman, well, this, what seems to you to be a woman doesn't want to be called a woman, mm -hmm. you should learn that you should not call her a woman. Uh, you figure this out yourself, basically, even when you're a young kid. Right, I right. think you figure out, you make once or twice mistake and then you figure it out. Now, this was more political and, for example, You would not make uh, uh, political jokes, although by high school time people would make political jokes, but certainly not in elementary school. We were, but you would know what is the limit. What did your parents do? Were they economists as well? Uh, yes, my father was. Really? Yes, well, uh, my father was. Uh, he started actually the he was before the World War II, actually, economics, then didn't finish it because of the war. And actually, he was in a, spent four years, it was an interesting career in some sense. He spent four years as a, a POW in Germany. What? Uh, yeah, of, of 1941 to 45. Where? Uh, Osnabrück. But m maybe somewhere else afterwards. You know, you know, people in those age, in, they didn't want to talk about that. How was it? You never talked about him? Like, well, uh, how, I mean, how, how was he treated? You know, it was POW camp, so it's right. not, uh, we are not talking about, uh, like, concentration camps. Right. He would, I mean, it, it was not great, but, you know, the Geneva Convention was observed. You know, they would get packages, uh, even letters. He learned in a camp that his mother died in, uh, in 1942 in, in Serbia. It was, it was actually worse to be in Serbia during the war than, than being here. I mean, this is, uh, yeah. Really? Well, it was worse because, you know, when, once you're in a camp, you're in a camp and even you get to food, you know. But in, if you're in a place where there is a war, you know, more than a million people actually, you know, died during the World War II in Yugoslavia. So it was, um, I mean, this is the irony of the situation. That, And um, then after that, he actually he worked for the Yugoslav occupation mission, which was under the British Uh, for seven years in Germany. So he lived in Germany in, in two different st statuses, if you will, as a P 
prisoner of war for four years mm. as a then quote unquote part of the occupying force for another seven years. And how did your parents meet? Oh, they met in Belgrade. My father, obviously, it postponed, I, su I suppose, objectively speaking, must have postponed my father's uh, uh, marriage, you know. But anyway, so they met, uh, my father was uh, 10 years older than my mother. They met in Belgrade when he came back uh, there uh, in the early 50s. So that's actually, yeah, that's how they met, yeah. And you were the first child? I was the only child. How, how did you grow up and what kind of circumstances? Like, were you well off compared to others? Yeah, I mean, we were part of, I actually mentioned that in one of my uh, uh, substacks, uh, we are part of kind of, you would call it, and people called it in 1968 during demonstrations, red bourgeoisie. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. because uh, your, um, my father was in the government, he had relatively, relatively, not very high, but relatively high position. And we knew lots of people who were basically his friends who were much higher. And now, for example, when people tell me how, for example, uh, uh, when I talk from the income distribution side, uh, how they lived, and it, it was nothing compared to today, you know, in terms of uh, uh, wealth or, you know, basically you were well off if you had a, an apartment with one or two bedrooms in a downtown Belgrade or Zagreb or Ljubljana. Mm -hmm. And some of them, not my family, because they, my father was not interested, but some of them, of course, had uh, uh, weekend houses, but that was the, or, or a car, but nothing beyond that. So your, your dad worked for the government. Mm -hmm. uh, what did your mom do? My mother was also studying actual economics and she graduated before my father wow. because of all this, because of what I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but and then she worked in a commercial bank, but you know, her for her work was uh, like in socialism, you know, most women, lots of women in urban areas and she comes from a fairly well educated family. They just saw it as normal to work. But I don't think that if I were to look at my mother, but I look at my mother now, that the work was really her primary sort of interest in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was also hard for women uh, because you had to work and then she had also to care of me and also to take care of the household because my father did very little. So both of them studied economy at, at some point. Did, yeah. you ever, did you ever talk to them about what they learned about studying economy and how to comprehend uh, e economy and were there theories back then compared to the theories you studied and the theories we we are taught now it's a very difficult question because to be quite honest we spoke much more at a sort of dinner table and things like that we spoke much more about politics Mm. Not so much about the about the economy. You know, there were big events in those days. I mentioned the Vietnam War, but there was also the invasion of Czechoslovakia, which was really a very big event. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was the, the the two wars in the Middle East, the '67 and then '73. Mm -hmm. Then there was a really nationalist movement in Croatia in 68. Then there were also student demonstrations in Belgrade 68. So we talked about that a lot. But in terms of economics, I, can, uh, but I cannot say that we talked about economic theories. Uh, but I did inherit my, from my father, I still have it uh, in my, uh, among my books, uh, all three tomes of, uh, of Das Kapital. Uh, trans first time translated in Yugoslavia after the war, because p previously to that the Communist Party was was banned. Mm. And uh, very nicely done, actually, even when I wrote my book recently, because I made my notes on top of my father's notes, I, I sort of went through it. Did he make you uh, read Marx? Or? No, he didn't make me read Marx, but uh, I suppose, I don't remember, but I suppose I didn't buy, uh, actually, it's only two volumes. The, uh, the third one, actually, uh, the, the first volume was not there. But I actually, the only one that I bought in 1970s, that uh, when I actually had to read Marx because the Faculty of Economics required that, uh, I only bought that one and the two others I just inherited from my father. So when I, whenever I uh, ask leading economists from Germany about, like, if, if they had read Marx or Keynes, they're usually like, what? No, no. No, I, I don't need to, don't need to read that. 
you know, that's one attitude, and it's not uncommon. Uh, people who believe that uh, that economics is a science, science, and develops linearly, or actually develops ever be, sort of understanding reality better. Right. They say, like, they say, like, why should I? For example, I'm a doctor, so why should I, as a doctor, read what um, you know was written in in uh, in uh, Greece? You know. I mean, that would be the answer. Yeah. But, but medicine is something yeah. else than economy. And it, it would like if you study philosophy or some other social science, you at some point go back in history and see how it all started, right? I could not agree more. Actually, for political science, they actually they, they obviously read Aristotle and Plato and Machiavelli and so forth, right. Bacon and but uh, and I think totally it is very wrong attitude from the economic point of view, from the economist point of view for the following reason. And I think that's where Marx really comes into the picture in a big way. Whatever you believe, you have to one I think has to logically realize that there are different modes of production or there are different social formations mm -hmm. so the rules of economics do not apply in the same way everywhere you know let's take socialism you were young to remember but they were of course you they had the part which was marketized economy you had part which was gray market and which was part planned or actually in yugoslavia it was labor managed you can still use the general principle that people try to better their own position and they would actually rather have more than less okay but the functioning of the economy cannot be just simply understand if you were to believe in the typical capitalist criteria because this uh, certain things did not exist there was no stock market for example mm. so uh, what i want to say is that you in order to Uh, to study the real world economy, you cannot take this approach of linear, linear progress, believing that 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 only what is now is sufficient for you to understand the past. And likewise, then the implication of that that the rules in the future could be different from the rules that are, that exist now, or actually social framework may be different. Mm. So that's why I believe that the, the, the uh, I'm in favor of evolutionary economics, but I'm not in favor of taking the, uh, uh, the uh, taking the concepts which exist in a sort of heavily marketized capitalist economy and believing that these concepts must exist everywhere. But why do people uh, or some economists believe that? Some economists believe that, and you know, you, you would actually say. I mean, let me give an example where there is a clash, clear clash, mm -hmm. when people study economic history uh, some people who would actually hold that view that they should not read anything prior to them uh, essentially say oh uh, rome all the cate categories in rome or in an economy full of slavery i can understand with the categories of today mm -hmm. but that's not true because you, they are in not only in those or in the middle ages if you have a guild system if you have a system of um, a coerced labor if you have a system where labor cannot simply move because legally it cannot move from this state to the other state you cannot just uh, use the concepts of free labor and wage labor it's 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 different even the price formation will be different because the guild would decide on the price and it would actually use the labor which is oftentimes comes from the family that was already in, involved in the guilds likewise for slavery i mean even slavery is such a complex and will not go into that but it's very complicated because it's not we tend to sort of ref project the uh, the american slavery because it is the most recent and brazilian slavery but for example slavery how do you explain that some slaves in the ottoman empire for example or in egypt uh, had their own slaves what slaves had their own slaves because they were state slaves they were actually at very high state positions but they were technically legally slaves and then they would have their own slaves what? Yes. I've never heard about that. Yeah, yeah it does exist, actually. Yeah. So, you know, you cannot, in other words, we cannot take out today's categories and believe that throughout all economic history we can apply them. And actually, that was a huge contribution, I think, of historical materialism and Marx and all that, is that every formation is a historical formation. So you have to study that, but when you move to a different one, you have actually to look at the laws of that different formation. 
The funny thing is those who like say they they don't or they, they've never read Marx or Keynes, they usually always have read uh, Hayek and other um You know, I, I don't know, neoliberal economists. Like von Mises, for example, yeah. 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 I, I've read, actually, I have lots of respect for Hayek. I think, actually, Hayek is readable. I mean, the, the stuff that he wrote are, I mean, it's, it's serious stuff. Um, I like, in particular, his, there are like, a, a, well, three volumes, but short volumes, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think his contribution, well, now I don't know if you push me to say about Hayek, but I think his huge contribution is that uh, he was the first to, to conceptualize very clearly that economic knowledge is a knowledge of the cause of circumstance and time. In other words, it's the, our knowledge now mm -hmm. that we have, there is a, we want more water, mm -hmm. and then there will be somebody who would, knowing that, going to produce that and sell it to us. So that that knowledge cannot be centralized. And for me, that was an extremely in, uh, strong insight, particularly living in a country that was to some extent uh, planified, that there was certain knowledge that the planners cannot have structurally because it's the knowledge that you have. You, you, you like green socks. That's not the knowledge that the planner will have. So when you started st uh, studying in Belgrade, right? I started studying in Belgrade, yes. What kind of economic theories or economy did you did you study? Did they give you like the Yugoslavia uh, mm -hmm. version of economy, or did did you study capitalism, socialism, whatever? <laughs> no, you're right. Actually, they basically uh, they they studied the Yugoslav. Well, the overarching theme was the Yugoslav version of Marxism, which was labor managed economy, mm -hmm. which meant that capital was owned socially, which doesn't mean by state, uh, which means basically technically you can say nobody. Uh, it is controlled, the companies, like for example this hotel, will be controlled and managed by people who work in a company. Uh, and, yeah, they, it's actually, well, there are certain Sounds good Well, there are certain good elements and there are certain bad elements to that, you know. Uh, this has been studied a lot in those days. There were, you know, journals and articles and all that. You know, let me tell you the bad element. The bad element is that if this is owned by labor, which sounds very good, and actually many people might like that, um, if the company does well, I suppose, uh, they don't want to hire more workers. They want to share all of that among themselves. So they naturally sort of tend to create unemployment or underemployment. That's one thing. Second, let me give you that other example because it's even more striking. Let's suppose that we are actually here and we are labor force and, you know, you probably, you do have some management role. You can decide maybe who is going, if not the director, but then the deputy director or something. But let's suppose that we now have to decide we have 100, uh, you know, euro of uh, net revenue, whether we should share that as wages or invest in sort of improving the rooms. Well, first of all, workers would rather share it as wages, right? And secondly, there more is... money in my pocket. Much more money in my pocket. And secondly, there was also the question of age. I'm older and I'm going to retire. So I really have an incentive that it should be all in wages because if we go and improve in this hotel, I'm leaving this hotel next year. But let's suppose you have a plan to stay in a hotel for 10 years, work in this hotel, and you believe if the rooms look nicer, we would attract more tourists and make more money. Mm -hmm. So there is really a sort of an uh, obvious age um, difference in in preferences and uh, uh, so there there are many there were many problems i mean i'm talking about theoretical problems and that there are other problems that uh, politicians uh, uh, manipulated the bank credit or they put really people who are badly educated or uneducated to high positions you know so you mean two, two examples of uh, of or uh, of the bad sides of uh, labor management what are the good sides Well, the, uh, I would say the good side is what you can call in today's language agency. I mean, there is no doubt that workers had greater uh, power. First of all, you could not fire them. Very, very difficult to fire them. And secondly, they had some role in selecting who is going to be their manager. Now, for larger enterprises, their managers essentially were appointed by 
government, which means basically by the Communist Party. But for smaller enterprises, they were, well, they were, it was between the Workers' Council and the local authorities. So, you know, you could actually choose to some extent. It's like a little bit like departments of, of economics, you know. They, they choose whoever or actually any academic department, whom do they want to be the dean, for example. It was relatively similar. And that gives you a little bit greater agency, I would say. I mean, I ask because like the democratization of work and the democratization of the economy has been a, is playing a huge role, I feel, more and more in the public consciousness. Um, what, what can we learn from, I totally, from past mistakes? No, I, I totally agree that, that we, we have a system which is interesting. Capitalist system is interesting in the following sense, in liberal capitalism. We have democracy in a political sense that, you know, everybody is technically equal. You can uh, choose whom you want to to rule you in some sense. And then you can dismiss that person, you know, the next elections. But when you look at how enterprises are run, they are run totally hierarchically. They are run in in the in the case of, of in political case, it's bottom level that selects middle and the middle or actually even the bottom selects the top. But in in a company, it's the top that selects the bottom. In other words, if I'm the manager, I choose you, I hire you, right? So it's really hierarchical principle. Right. Democratization of uh, workforce that you mentioned, I think it's a very legitimate and desirable aim. Uh, well, after all, you know, in, in Western Europe, you, there are cases of, of that as well. You know, Italy had uh, cooperatives, a bus country had the Mondragon cooperative. And of course, as you know, in Germany, obviously, you know better than but co-determination and the role of still now of labor on, on management boards. So it does exist as an idea, uh, not only as idea, it actually exists in practice. The question is actually, can we push that further? And have it uh, much more, much more prevalent. And uh, so I would be, I would be quite happy to to see that, including worker ownership, uh, but uh, workers actually having shares of the companies and through share ownership managing them. So back to you at university. Did you learn about capitalism? Evil capitalism. No, we learned about, we had a really sort of interesting uh, structure. Uh, I mentioned this overarching stuff was Yugoslav application of Marxism. But uh, um, we studied Marx, obviously, and as I mentioned, that's why I read the, the, well, I didn't read the entire three volumes then, but I read maybe about, I don't know, 40% of the whole thing. Uh, Keynes as well? And Keynes. Keynes actually not, the, I mean, The macroeconomy was entirely Keynesian. Is actually, if you take Samuelson, uh, it's basically copied Samuelson. So if you want to be really sort of, uh, to look at that from that particular ideological angle, you would say that we would study the first uh, two years, we would study Marx, stop with Marx, and then go into macroeconomics, or basically capitalist macroeconomics which was not totally inapplicable to Yugoslavia because it was a decent, decentralized decision-making. So you did have similar issue, let's suppose, uh, well, Yugoslavia had huge unemployment. Many people came to Germany to work. Like at one point, more than a million Yugoslavs were in Germany as workers. So it, there was a macroeconomic management issue, which in, in what sen that sense, Keynes was, not, was useful. So did you learn about evil capitalism of the West or not? We didn't call it evil capitalism, but it was an inferior source. You, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, it was an inferior, or uh, how would I take it, an inferior social formation that was, th the standard formula would be as follows. It was more economically developed, but it is socially behind us. In other words, the social relations in socialism were better, but because of historical reason, reasons, capitalist countries like Germany, well, West, West Germany or, or Sweden or France were richer. So there was this distinction. It kind of sounds like the two Germanys until 1990, like there was the capitalist West, they were more uh, economically progressive. And then there was the, the former GDR that was, of course, uh, economically behind, but socially much more progressive. The role of the women and 
all of that? I think that would be the, generally speaking, that would be the idea which would uh, be, how should I say, inculcated to you, I mean, officially. Uh, yes, we are behind, but we are behind, behind economically for many reasons, and we are catching up, but socially we are more progressive. They are richer, but we are richer as a society or something. So along these lines, you know, of course, you know, things changed over the years. I think by 1990 or as, as you know, even better here, by, I would say already by, by the early 80s, it was, um, it was more difficult to, to maintain that idea. Uh, but um, officially, certainly in the 70s, that was absolutely the, the case. Did you... Uh, learn at your university the external external effects of um, running a, an economy you know uh, did you know how or did, 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 did they teach you how the way the global society or your society or the west is um, affecting our climate our nature no in those days I'm actually much older than, than you climate did not figure at all no, no. Environment and climate, I honestly don't remember. Maybe I just forgot, but it didn't figure compared to today, not at all. But, but, yeah. but everybody sees, you know, uh, when there's smoke coming out of uh, factories. and so, How did, uh, did everybody ignore that? I think most people ignore it. I do, actually. I'm a little, how should I say, my background is different and maybe I was more interested in certain issues. But I do remember, for example, Club of Rome. Oh. But I do remember that because I was interested in that. I actually think even my father brought uh, some articles about that. Uh, so I do remember that. But, you know, it's not, it's not something that would be studied in school. I, I honestly cannot remember But as I say, maybe I forgot. I cannot remember that we studied anything which had to do with the environment. Have you caught on? Caught on by now? No, maybe not 100%. percent. <laughs> I've caught up, but I, I, I do still have. Uh, and some people who read my Substack will see that I still had debates with uh, Jason Hickel and um, at uh, at uh, uh, Rayworth. Uh, um, on, uh, I'm actually good friends with Jason and actually I think there are certain things that I, I would not write now that I wrote about three years ago but you know the debate is for the following reason there um, people who insist on the importance of climate change and degrowth the degrowth is for me the, the main issue do not sufficiently realize that if we were really to implement degrow, uh, to stop growing, mm -hmm. it would mean that many people in the world who are currently poor will have to remain poor, right? Then they say, okay, fine, we don't like that, but we would then redistribute income from the rich West to them. So they can grow and we don't. Exactly, but you know, that's politically not feasible and actually if you have an envelope we suppose your, your GDP is 100 and you say okay we don't want to increase emissions and we will keep it to 100 you really have a very unpleasant choice either you keep people who are currently poor and you know we have 10% of the world population that is below really subsistence minimum of like two dollars per day right. 1.9 uh, either you keep them poor Or you say, okay, let them grow, but then I'm going to take money from you and everybody else, and sort of we would become less rich, and we would, the West, or the rich countries, and we would cease growing, and we would even decline in terms of the real GDP, it would go down. Yeah. And honestly, I just cannot see how that can be politically acceptable. Forget about how you would do it if, technically, but even politically it's totally unacceptable. So that's where my disagreement with them was, and I believe that uh, maybe it's very economistic, you would say, but I believe that through a combination of taxation and subsidies, we can actually affect uh, consumption of and production of the activities that are most, uh, you know, emitting the most, uh, that create the problem of, of climate change. But, but in the end, we need to uh, get the emissions to zero and all the other stuff that is also affecting the planet. The, the, the problem is not only climate change and the CO2 emissions, but also you know biodiversity and other planetary boundaries. Uh, 
And so far in the last couple of decades, economic growth worldwide, globally, always meant more destruction of nature, you know, uh, killing resources, uh, digging it up. Uh, growth means more growth means more, more emissions. So how, how, do, how do we get out of that vicious cycle? Because in the end, we don't need any emissions or we cannot have any emissions. No, the, in, the, in the end, we actually don't need growth of the emissions. We will always have some emissions. I mean, otherwise we would you know, not exist as a species, which we might anyway decide not to exist as a species for other reasons. But uh, <laughs> no, Nobody means human emissions, you know, but like... The... But the, the objective, of course, is sort of net zero in the sense of net increase. But uh, let me go back to actually uh, to... And I'll come to, um, in a standard, and then go back to, to Marx, in a standard Marxist, Marxist framework, which was basically enlightenment framework, you would actually see our uh, human ability to exploit nature. In other words, to be uh, in control as a big plus. It's actually celebration of human ability. So the fact that we built this building, the fact we actually got rid of all the grass here and put like stones, it was seen as a positive stuff. More recently, of course, there is an attempt and maybe justified to actually take some pieces from Marx's own writings and actually see it in a different way as a more sort of conscious towards uh, the destruction of the environment. And I, I have to say, when you asked me about question, did I study that? I said, absolutely, that part, not at all. Now, going back to the question, uh, yes, there is, I don't have an answer of how to get out of this dilemma. I have the answer for, strictly speaking, for uh, improving the type of growth that we are having. And I think this is not something new, but it's really essentially very heavy taxation of activities that are actually CO2 producing. Uh, I mean, if you were to start taxing very heavily cars, uh, not uh, meat consumption, cars, uh, uh, airplanes, uh, uh, you would actually probably uh, be able to reduce, as we did reduce, actually look at how, what happened during COVID. We reduced air transportation by 60%. What about outlawing stuff? I mean, you can, of course, tax the use of private jets, but you can also just say, okay, we're going to outlaw that until you have a private jet that doesn't emit anything. You you could, you know, you like could. A moratorium. No, no, you could. I mean, I'm just uh, saying when I see, when I had this discussion, I'm just not seeing the political feasibility of certain of these things. And I'm also not very happy... Uh, Kate Rayworth is actually having this plan for Amsterdam. Uh, and I, I see the advantages of that, but I just cannot understand how that would be, uh, how you're going to convince India not to grow. If they say, well, look, guys, I have an income which is one-tenth of yours, yours, so why do you ask me not to grow? But is, 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 is it your job to think about the political feasibility of stuff or is it your job to find out what a solution can be? Well, maybe the, the two, you know, but I, I think that if you propose as a solution something that simply, well, maybe that's going back to whether economics is a science or is actually art of, uh, art of the possible, as they say, for politics. If you come and propose something with you, that on paper seems good, but that you will not have any political support and you would not know even how to implement that, I don't see that as particularly useful. I mean, you can say, well, maybe it would be useful in the future because somebody might pick it up in you know, 20 years or 50 years. I'm not necessarily against that, but I just... Uh, uh, let me be very clear. I'm quite aware of the problems that we face, including what you mentioned, destruction of spe species. Uh, but I'm not sure that, actually, I don't believe that uh, stopping growth is an answer to that which is uh, fair to people who are poor and which is politically feasible. But can there be like a different solution? Like in the end, we don't want people to be poor, right? We don't want uh, great inequality globally. Maybe there's we can help people 
in another way and then when they're not poor and the, the inequality is not as, as big then we can think about uh, the rest no I agree with that you know but let me just give I, you aren't you stuck in the in the same capitalistic thinking yes I am yeah you know I am maybe, maybe yeah. you need to get unstuck or something Maybe, maybe I should get <laughs> stuck. <laughs> But let me give you an example. I, when people say, okay, you know, you look at people who are well off like us and so on, and they say, okay, we could also reduce our consumption. And of course, we always look to those who have more than us and say, okay, they, they should even reduce it more and so on. Uh, there is a very sort of uh, stubborn fact that uh, if you take rich countries, basically the West, and... OECD countries, and you look at the median income person, and many of us are above the median income person in the rich world, that median income person, which, in, which is at the 50th percentile by definition of the rich countries, is at the 91st percentile of the world income distribution. So basically, if you wanted to go to, to everybody consuming the same amount that is the mean today, you would have to push that person really in terms of uh, his or her consumption very much down. And that I, that's what I find really difficult to imagine under the, the current conditions. But wait, I mean, that, that's one thing I learned over the years. As, at least in the West, the people in the West, we are consuming way too much. In German, in German we call it Überkonsum. Uber con, con, consumption. Right, yeah, yeah, I know. So we, we, we need to consume less uh, anyway. Yes, but do you notice that people have been doing that? No. So why why don't they consume you less? Tell me, you're the economist. <laughs> no, it's actually, I, I'm an economist and I say people always want to consume more. I remember, you know, I was teaching for a year in Barcelona And there would be very many young people, I mean, really beautiful people, and they were very concerned about climate change and all these issues, and generally were. But, you know, they still wanted to fly every weekend for 30 euro to, to Budapest or Prague uh, or Paris. Or, so, you know, it, we always want to consume more. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we are conscious and maybe we can on on the edges reduce consumption we have that every day like in a, you go to a hotel and they tell you if, you know if you agree we will not change towels which i totally agree we don't I, nobody changes towels every day at home so i don't see why we should change them in a hotel so you do save something uh, but uh, but i don't think that it is a, it, these are really things at the margin let me tell you like one thing that i just remember now This is the extreme case, but, and he was not... You know, there was a communist leader in Poland, uh, Vladislav Gomulka, and he was an ascetic guy. Mm -hmm. So he didn't like consumption, not because of climate change in those days, but simply he didn't like uh, consumption display or anything like that. Right. So he was famous in Poland for having said, that was in 1970s, having said, like, does anyone need more than two pairs of socks? Because one pair you wear today, and then you wash, you know, you wash the next day, and you take the other pair. Yeah. And it's it's quite logical, actually. Uh, but uh, you know, we have more than two pairs, and uh, you know, each of us believes that that he or she has the right amount. But for some of us, it's like 20, and others have 200. <laughs> well, could like the restriction of consumption be a solution? You know, regulating it. You, you were mentioning flights. I mean, uh, we, we had an expert on, uh, he mentioned, like, at least in Germany, 70% of all people in Germany uh, annually never fly anyway. Then there's like 20% or 25% of people who uh, fly once or twice a year to their vacation spot. And then there's the top 5%. The rich who like fly everywhere uh, all the time, and they are the main reason why um, flying is so bad for the economy. And he was like, "How about we like society, like as a society, restrict flying and say, okay, you can fly back and forth three times a year, which wouldn't affect 70% percent of those people who never fly anyway, 20% percent who fly once twice right. a year, and it would only affect the top five." Per five percent i totally agree i think actually if we were really serious but that's the issue then of political mm -hmm. political feasibility 
If we were totally serious, we could actually select, let's suppose, 20, acti 20 activities or consumption goods or whatever, and actually put uh, uh, like why well, either quantitative restrictions and this would be the case mm -hmm. you can fly three times and maybe if you just there are special reasons that you can fly the fourth time okay sure. but we would have quantitative restrictions for some of them we could actually have exorbitant uh, uh charges like uh you know, you know, there were countries in used to be uh, Singapore as an example. Uh, they used to have, for example, on cars, hundred percent tax. Oh. So you could actually have really exorbitant taxes, and you could even have the third category, the one that you mentioned. There are certain goods that would not be sold at all, or actually practically not at all. You might say actually every I don't know a, a private jet or some yacht which has uh, is just is not produced, or well, you cannot stop from producing. You say okay, again, if you produce it, you have even the company has to pay huge amount for the privilege of producing. I mean, we could technically do that without, uh, you know, destroying society. And I think, like, uh, as a naive person, it would even be um, popular because, like, uh, the restriction on flying, for example, wouldn't affect 95 percent. Sure. Of the population, so you know. Well, your show is called naive, but you're not naive. Uh, but uh, I, I agree with that. Actually, it would not affect. And let me give you. Well, now I'm sort of switching on your side, but I can see the two sides of the problem. Let me uh, remember during COVID, the very fact that nobody else could fly made your not flying feel much better exactly yeah true it's, I it's, totally psycholo agree. it's a psychological uh, issue if you know all everybody else is also affected by this then it's much more it seems more just more fair i don't i mean i experienced it myself it first seems more just and secondly it um, how should i say there is always an invidious part to consumption is that actually you need to have you want to have something that people who have more money have or that actually other expect from you to have. So whether we want to really ignore that, I think it's still there. But once, as it was then the case, there was a total ban, like practically the, the air, as you know, air transportation went down, like, as I said, 60%. Yeah. But during a period of time, it was like almost like down to zero. Uh, you just felt... Uh, well, I'm not flying to this conference in Berlin, but nobody else is. Consequently, we would all maybe see each other on the screen, but we are. I'm not losing very much, you know. So it was clearly linked to other people. So it was not only the consumption of your good. Right. So I agree. Yeah. So there, there's like. A I forgot his name, but an American uh, academic who once said it's easier to imagine the end of uh, oh, yeah. the world than the end of capitalism. Yeah. Does it uh, resonate with you? Well, yeah, it's, it's clever, actually, uh, as the French say, clever more. It's a clever way, uh, thing to say, but I, I don't actually, technically, I, I don't think I would agree, because that was, we are going back to what we discussed about economics as, uh, as a social science. Uh, I think, actually, that the way that the society can be organized, in the, the ways are not exhausted. And that's why I don't agree with the end of history, Fukuyama and all that. It right. seems to us an end of history. And again, uh, historical knowledge is very important. There is a very good book which is called, um, uh, I'll remember in a moment, uh, uh, by an Italian author about the Roman, uh, Roman Empire, which actually begins with an, uh, a, a praise and commune, as it's called, given by a, a Roman uh, philosopher and speaker, orator, where he says, and it was about year 150, when he speaks of how much Roman Empire has accomplished in terms of trade, expansion, develop, what we would call development, and essentially says nothing better than this could ever happen or be imagined. <laughs> And to us, it seems like, wow, how, how could he have believed that, you know? But within a historical framework, he could not imagine airplanes, but we cannot imagine something else. Right. So to believe that we have exhausted, of course, it was, as you know, Fukuyama was based in, on Hegel, but to believe that we have exhausted possibilities of uh, uh, a reinvention of human, of the way that your society is 
organized. I think it's naive. It's just basically, okay, to use Marxist, reification of the present. Like when I talk to economists here, many answer like when you ask them about the end of capitalism in one way or the other, they are all, they're mostly like, so you want communism? Oh, you want socialism? And I f usually find that very lazy thinking. Like it's like a bipolar thing. It's either capitalism or communism from the 20th century. Maybe there should be a new way of economic thinking, like a third option, a new option. Yeah, I think there would be actually there would be new options. Uh, first, I want to say that the name of the of the, well, the historian is Aldo Schiavone, uh, and it's called "The End of the Past." Uh, the book it's about the Roman Empire. Uh, it's a, but really it's historical. It's not his. It's all, uh, it was basically about the economics of the Roman Empire. Okay, now going to back to and I think that's why it is important also to know economic history because you realize these people who said these things then they were not less smart than we are, but they took the, the existence as the, the maximum that was possible from their point of view, right. as we take it now. Yeah. So I totally agree with you. I think very often people say oh, communism has failed. There is no doubt about that. Nobody is actually talking now about the nationalization of property, nationalization of all of this. Yeah. We would, uh, what will I think happen, if, if you really want to be optimistic, is that new social formations or new ways of organized production will happen, uh, will occur within the capitalist society. And you can say, okay, there is a certain uh, sort of... Uh, symmetrical relationship with the development of capitalism. Capitalism did, did not develop out of feudal society because somebody at one day decided that everybody would be capitalist. It happened over several centuries and the gradual transformation, which then of course led, if you want, to the, the, the Dutch city-states, then to British industrialization and so forth. And even when you try to figure out when capitalism started, you really have hard time because some people say it was 12th or you know, 13th century in the uh, city-states of Italy, like Venice or Pisa, others say, no, it was later. But I think actually what will happen, we would not be, maybe, well, we would certainly not be, neither, well, I obviously, but it, let's suppose 200 years, we will not be here, but it would be a different society. And so that I am actually, I believe that actually we can change society incrementally from within. But there's the issue of time when it comes to climate change. Like we don't have centuries of uh, finding a new way of, uh, you know, a new economy. Like we actually, it would be best to, to find it in the next decades. No, that's true. Actually, there is a there is an, e an issue of time. Uh, the the question then becomes that's yeah. a big difference to the past. True, it's true. Actually, then the question becomes of having. Uh, for the climate, for the issues that we discussed, like you know, a couple of minutes ago, uh, implementing them faster than than what we are doing, you know. But you know, let me. There is another also uh, inequality issue in climate change. We spoke about uh, who is the main emitters and what happens and whether you can actually ban consumption of certain goods and so on. But you have also the the historical element, which of which I thought recently when I saw the interview on BBC by the, uh, the interviewer and uh, the Prime Minister of Guyana. Mm -hmm. And this guy, of course, the interviewer was actually trying to put the blame and guilt on Guyana exploiting uh, large findings of um, oil. Mm -hmm. But the, the Prime Minister said, but look, who is responsible for this problem? It, it, we were not responsible. Guyana was poor. You know, we have all the forests which we have kept for, you know, since the whenever, when it was formed. Uh, we have also the issue of justice. And you pushed me in that direction because you said, actually, there is an issue of time. Mm -hmm. But we have also, when you look backward, also, it is the rich countries that are responsible for the creation of the problem. And of course, then China, as it grew in the last 40 years. So the distribution of the guilt over that is really related to the level of development you know P probably people in in congo are not particularly responsible for for climate change sure and so i want to say actually just wanting to bring that other element of, of justice it doesn't uh, answer your question about time Uh, but the only answer that one can give to that, I believe, is to say that many of the 
sort of things that we mentioned before should be done more urgently. But you know, that's easy to say, like, how, but how do you do it? Sort of like maybe the last question concerning the future of capitalism in Europe, they try to like make it and the Greens here, the Green Party here, like they think of a green capitalism. Do you think that's possible or is it just like, well, I, I mean, it sounds there. good, you know, uh, we, you know, everything is now green. You know, I think actually m many of the companies that claim certain things, honestly, I, I don't believe it. And when I speak to people who work, for example, in um, sort of investment markets and stuff, they don't believe it either, you know. It's like, uh, what is this called, British Petroleum that then decides to call this um, itself uh, beyond uh, beyond petroleum. It's just like a, like a joke, you know. Uh, so I don't, I mean, the, the, the term is kind of sounds nice, uh, but we will see how it can be done, you know. It's not obvious that it will be, it would happen. Back to you. Um, so you, you studied, you started studying economy in Belgrade. At one point, did you know that this is this is going to be your life? That you want to uh, stay in the academic arena and all that? Well, I, I didn't know actually. M many of things in my life happened uh, without any particular planning. There, I think there was a very large element of uh, what they call it serendipity, uh, accidents and stuff. But I think that uh, my interest in income inequality was. Uh, I, I can tell you where it comes from. It comes from the social interest that I had that I mentioned before. And the fact that I studied statistics, economics, actually, you had to decide at a certain point whether you want to study this or that, I don't know, international trade or macro, or I don't remember what were the options. I was fairly good, always good, and I always liked numbers. And on top of that, mathematics was, okay, you know, I was okay, I, but but... You know, there is a little bit of difference between loving numbers and being mathematician. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, doing statistics, uh, uh, well, we did all these distributions and stuff, but I could not see the application very much of that until I saw... Uh, distributions of income and wealth and then I said wow look this looks really cool because things that they know about normal distribution or you know chi-square or this or that suddenly can be uh, can be applied to something which already existed and uh, the data existed and so on so that's where my interest for income distribution sort of came and your professors were okay with it or well you know like branco come on uh, take uh, better care of, of trade or something look we were there were so many people actually in, in there's no inequality in yugoslavia okay well it was a little bit of a problem with uh, when i did the dissertation because i had three mentors and um, you know the committee of three and one of them was kind of reluctant to you know they all have to accept the uh, the synopsis and uh, uh, afterwards they have to obviously ac accept the, uh, your work uh, but uh, there were a little bit of a sort of um, with one of them was not particularly happy and tried to not much but tried to sort of fashion it a little bit in a way how did you convince them that this topic is essential and uh, important uh, you know you, you be, i mean people you know just agree uh, if you just persist and you know they're not unreasonable people so uh, but i would say it, it was not a topic uh, even in the west that for the reasons that i mentioned before that it was not a very popular topic at all and uh, many people who wanted to do more uh, demanding quote unquote stuff uh, with numbers, with formulas, with equations. They would go in macroeconomics. They would go in finance, of course, not only for money, but it would it would look, I have to say, it would look much more macho. So I'm going, wow, to do some really phenomenal equations with, you know, financial sector. And uh, issues like inequality and social policy was, and particularly, I think, so in Eastern Europe, and I saw that in Russia when I worked in Russia in the 1990s, were all done by women, essentially. It was just like, not number, but, you know, like social policy, uh, uh, child allowances, uh, you know, family. It was seen as almost uh, not sufficiently economic. And, you know, Economics, the fact is, actually, is the most uh, uh, unfriendly science to women. 
you have seen the statistics to that? That actually it's more unfriendly than physics or any other. Why is that? Well, th there are different theories, actually. I, I don't know what it is, but the, the fact is that actually until very recently, there were relatively few top women uh, economists, that economists tend to be, how should I say, unpleasant. I don't want to use some other words, uh, but they tend to be arrogant and they take, and uh, they, uh, in the discussion, they tend to be, um, to believe that they are smarter than anybody else and for many women that's intimidating and they don't want to go into a sort of arguments immediately you know I've, I've been in situations a couple of times once i remember quite well with the person who did it that literally after one sentence of my presentation he interrupted me and he said this is like that you and i i'm just like shocked and i can imagine that in those days i think it's a little bit better now many women found that absolutely you know intimidating and you know they don't want to get into the argument after the first sentence so back to your topic of inequality like i mean it's 2024 now you started uh, focusing in on uh, focusing in on it uh, in the mid 80s i guess mid mid 80s yeah exactly mid 80s yeah how come that you that is that it's still such a big topic for you i mean it's it's been 40 years hasn't there been have, haven't you studied all that that there is um well more or less but you know it Come has, with another topic branko no 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 i'm too old for that but let me tell you it, it, things change you know i when i started actually working on that i started working first in the socialist economy and in individual country mm -hmm. and on top of that when i did my dissertation with, of which i now think i made a mistake because i was sort of very much marxist oriented left wing oriented so instead of actually i should have actually studied inequality in each of the republics because that really eventually mattered but i studied uh, you could study differently inequality between um, workers uh, rural population pensioners and mixed population so that's what i did so that changed but also uh, since the late actually my first paper is in 99 on global inequality i didn't think of global inequality until i came to the world bank And then I saw in a unit when I was working, I was working actually on Eastern Europe, a lot of that on Poland and Russia. And then I, that was the unit which would get the data from a bunch of countries, from Africa, Asia, and so on. And then I said, well, look, I can actually put together a global income distribution. And so going back to, to what you said, uh, you know, the, the topic of income distribution varies it's not like just one and then afterwards i became more interested in how much of your income for example is determined by your country of origin how much by the the background of your parents that's yet another topic so there are really different topics um, that you can more recently had like for example a couple of papers on corruption in china and inequality so it's not when you say inequality is not just one topic so Tell our, our audience why they should care about uh, inequality. Because, like as I said before, many will say, Franco, uh, societies all over the world have always been unequal. Uh, there have always been poor countries and rich countries. There have always been in those countries poor people and rich people. It will always stay like that. There will always be inequality. Let's get over with. Uh, let's talk about something else. Well, obviously, I do agree that there will be very likely always some inequality simply because people are different, interests are different, their abilities are different. So there will be some. But the question is, are the types of inequality that we are talking about today, are all of them justifiable in some sense? And there you can say okay that was the same argument that slaveholders used for slavery slavery always existed right. so it just happens i'm a slave owner and you're a slave and let's kind of get over it let's deal with it yeah, yeah let's deal with it you know adam smith for example since i was writing this book on you know historical thinkers uh, adam smith was against slavery but he believed that slavery would never be abolished because the slaveholders mm keep political power and the slaveholders to vote or to decide that to get rid of slavery means that they actually have to cut a, to give away a significant part of their wealth right. 
So that's what he believed. And if you look at the two cases, U.S. versus U.K., what happened in the case of the U.S., the slavery was abolished through violent means. And what happened in the U.K. is that Parliament had to pick up to collect money to pay to the slave owners. And similarly happened, for example, in Haiti, that kept on paying money to France until very recently uh, for 200 years as a compensation for uh, uh, original families of the slave owners in Haiti. Yeah, I mean, Haiti kept on paying, actually, that was interesting, Piketty's book, I didn't know about that, kept on paying reparations uh, to the slave owner, or families, obviously, for, I think, almost 200 years to France. That's crazy. It is crazy, absolutely crazy. And that's why you kind of, when you see it, you kind of remember it and can't believe. But going back to your question. Yes. So I believe uh, that the argument that there will be always some inequality is true, but it's not the reason why we should not worry about the types of inequality which exist now, whether they're inequality between capital owners and those who don't have capital, between those who have good jobs and those who actually have have uh, what is called bullshit jobs or shitty jobs uh, or inequality between women and men or inequality between different uh, uh, religion or different ethnicity or different race or whatever. So that's the one issue. And then you can actually say, as I often say, uh, there is also an instrumental reason to worry about inequality. If you can show, and I think we have some empirical evidence, that in a very, very unequal countries, growth rate is negatively sort of influenced by high inequality. If you very have very high inequality, you might actually have inability of people, poor people to go to university, to schools and all of that. You might act, you have uh, uh, control of the political process by the rich. You, per, for example, the land ownership is unequal and so on. So there are really reasons why you might, uh, political instability is greater. You might grow more slowly. And final reason, which I think most people would um, agree with, is that inequality in current, what is called outcomes, which means in income between you and me, gets transmitted to the family and actually makes our kids start from very unequal positions. So when you tell people, look, if the current inequality transfers across generations, that means inequality of opportunity is from the very beginning very different. Nobody defends that practically. People don't defend it. They, nobody says, okay, I totally agree that actually people of rich, fam of uh, poor families, kids from poor families should not have opportunities. Very hard to defend that. But then again, the society usually in the West doesn't want to do anything about it because like the 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 rich parents uh, of kids like they do everything they can that their kids um, remain um, you know, that they have more chances in school in, in university in life than than poorer kids no like, it's true actually when like, like rich parents are afraid I would say are afraid of equal opportunities for all kids I do agree with you on that, and actually I, I, I think that's a very controversial view, but I think that extreme, extraordinarily high costs of education in the U.S. are partly driven by the rich people being willing to pay them as a monopoly price for not allowing the kids of poor parents to accede there. Yeah. So they are actually willing to pay that because it makes their children much more likely to get all the advantages from education. It keeps yeah. the poor out. Yeah, I actually think so. So when people actually complain about uh, huge costs of education, really sort of skyrocketing pro price of, uh, of uh, private education, I believe that very often it's the interest of the, of the wealthy. They are not going to tell you that because it sounds bad, but I think that's what they, they think. So... Um... When it, when it comes to German politics and whenever the, the topic of inequality comes up, German politicians, no matter what party or our government, they only care about income equal inequality, but not wealth inequality. Is that like a typical um, reaction in a capitalist society that like uh, governments and parties don't want to talk about wealth inequality or um, is the income inequality the real deal? 
No, no, I think both are important. Of course, in, in a, I, I've been working only with income inequality. I mean, throughout my life, I have not worked with, for example, micro data on wealth because or when I started working, it was much more difficult to get wealth data. However, I do agree that wealth inequality, the data are more difficult to get, but it is an extremely important, maybe even more important part than income inequality because wealth really is what we were just talking before, is uh, is a sort of a thing which allows you to extend your power across generations. Yeah, wealth is power. Wealth is power. Wealth is power, and actually, what is also interesting, it it allows you to extend that that power over generations. I, for example, my wife and I are thinking now of, of like having a will and all of that, and I didn't will. No will, will a, a testament, will? Oh. testament <laughs> to to whom to leave the the money and stuff, the house, and you know, actually, I didn't know that before, but you could and that's why it is power you could actually decide or restrain what actions you want ch your children and their children even to undertake with you, the wealth they would inherit from you really? so that that power transmits over generations and i, I obviously i think total, this totally unfair if you already gave some something to somebody that's it that's no no longer yours yours especially if you're dead but it's weird actually that that power can be carried over several generations why is that lawful Oh, why, why is that legal? Why is that possible? Uh, well, I don't know because I, I don't know what originally, who originally introduced that. But I think the the reason it probably exists in Germany as well. I mean, this time talking about the U.S. rules. Uh, I think it's probably introduced by rich people who essentially wanted to control, even after their own death, they want to control how the wealth that they have is going to be used. When it comes to Germany, I mean, we abolished the aristocracy uh, many decades or probably more than 100 years ago. But nowadays, um, I mean, you're an expert in income, but I mean, let's, let's stick yeah, with, okay. with wealth inequality uh, for a second. Most of the wealth in Germany is, not, is, is being inherited. Uh, you know, from parents to children, like nowadays, like I think 60, 70 percent of all wealth will be handed down to your children. You, you don't, you don't get rich through hard work and labor and uh, th th through luck or something. Uh, is inheriting wealth is that democratic? No, I, I mean, if if you look even at Rawls and you know theory of justice, one of the things when he defines different types of equality, and one thing that he says must not be allowed after a certain probably level, he doesn't put like numbers. Mm -hmm. It's really inheritance. It's very difficult to justify large, especially inheritance, from the point of view of I mean. If you believe in in some equality of opportunity, yeah. it's it's very difficult. There is no way to justify it. And uh, uh, the when people say, for example, in the U.S., they call that when they don't want to have taxation of wealth inheritance, uh, they say it is a death tax. Like you die, and on top of that, you get the tax. <laughs> But <laughs> of course, it is simply a a way to be against the tax. But in reality, who is taxed is people to whom you exactly. give this, the and person. they have not actually done anything technically to deserve that wealth. Right. So it, it is, uh, uh, yeah, it is, it is really not, uh, I would say it is not justifiable. I'm not a purist in the sense that I would ban everything or tax 100% everything, but certainly above certain limit, which I think should be relatively low, uh, I, I think you should basically tax it. Like what, what, what tax it away. What does low mean? $500,000, a million dollars? I would, well, I really don't know, but I would say 500 or something like that. I think it is, uh, uh, you can maybe even possibly, I mean, this is just a really thinking, you could even possibly link it to the housing prices of You know, as as a as in uh, how should I say, as an inflation indicator, because housing is really crucial. Uh, I think in the sense that the transferring of of housing to some to some extent is, I think, acceptable because the parents are giving to the child. But uh, 
I think you can link it to something like that. But, you know, it is, as somebody mentioned the other day, that because the Western societies have become very rich uh, with relatively few kids, uh, that there will be, uh, my generation is dying out, and there will be a, 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 an enormous transfer of wealth, which w is happening now and will happen probably in the next 10 to 20 years. And uh, that would really make uh, chances of people... Um, who obviously received them as versus those who have not received them are very different. I mean, that's the funny part. Like there will be, and it's already going on, a massive transfer of wealth. And also there, there's a need of a lot of money for the tr transformation to a, let's, yeah. ca let's call it a green economy, you know, no CO2 emissions, yeah. all that. So there's a, there's huge money coming in from you know as if, if I'm like yeah. the state and like oh I could I could get taxes out of this and also oh I need this money as well but these two are not linked it's a good point actually I mean you could possibly then call it a green green inheritance taxation and tax it out you for it Yeah, I, I'm definitely for all inheritance taxation above a certain limit. As we said, maybe 500,000 euro. Uh, I think 500,000 euro is quite a significant amount of money. Uh, so it's not, uh, you know, extortion, uh, um, extortionary. Uh, but uh, yeah, one could link it explicitly to the transformation. I mean, if I, if I play a wealthy guy for a second, he'd be like, so what do I do with my Picasso in, in, uh, on, on my wall? How do you how do you tax that? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, there, there are always issues, you know. There are actually the, the it can't right. be done, Branco. Well, you can. There is also issue of valuing and all of that. But you know, the, the the house prices, for example, you transfer housing to to your kids. The house prices are all on the internet. You actually find out how much they cost. So it, there is a market. Uh, well, maybe for Picasso, and it's harder to know what it is. Uh, but um, maybe all the Picassos should be anyway taken and put in the museums anyway. <laughs> exactly. So wh why did you focus on income inequality? Because in those days, uh, you know, income data were more available, and I was uh, also maybe there was an influence of, of communism there, because there are income data, there are income surveys, and there are differences in income and so on. But differences in wealth are very small. Uh, simply because there were no privately owned shares, for example, there was no financial assets. And uh, I mentioned, for example, the red bourgeoisie, which had like weekend homes, but that was really relatively small difference, relatively small, I'm not saying, I'm not minimizing it, but you know, there were no financial assets. So financial assets, when you look at the US and uh, Germany is even more concentrated, 10% uh, uh, of population owns 90% of U.S. financial assets, meaning bonds, stocks, shares, uh, including through pension funds. Yeah. So essentially, all the financial sector of rich countries is owned by about 10% of people within each country. So it's a very, very, very heavy concentration of, of that. Housing is a different matter because obviously rich people have better housing, but housing is more distributed along the income distribution. But just to give you another example for the importance of wealth concentration in rich countries, not in other countries, in rich countries, about 30% of population have households, not population, have zero or negative wealth. Mm -hmm. There are, of, you know, households that actually owe more in, you know, credit card debt in other forms of debt than their assets. So that's the distribution. Actually, going back to your, you know, percentages, we have in rich countries, one third approximately with zero assets, then everybody up to the 95th percentile, which would be then 65% of people, having the bulk of their assets in housing and car, you know, whatever, chairs and all of that, or maybe second home. Everyday use. Everyday Most use, yes. And then you have about five, Essentially, five at most 10% of people were actually financial assets dominate, and that's where the wealth is. And that goes back to our beginning of the conversation. That part was not really studied, even in rich countries, in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. And um, what, do we, what do people have to know when, when it comes to in income inequality in general? 
Well, people have to know, I think, that income inequality, they should not be mistaken by believing that there is inequality as versus equality, because a typical argument when people say to you, oh, you know, you study inequality, do you think that we should all, we should all have the same income? <laughs> you say no, because uh, think of inequality like you think of the temperature. And I use that, you know. Mm -hmm. Inequality measure, one of the most common uses is the Gini coefficient. It goes from zero when Tech, theoretically, everybody has the same income, mm -hmm. to 100 when one person has the entire income. Obviously, the two extremes are like, you know, not, uh, 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 didn't exist, nor will exist in any society. Mm -hmm. And then when I say, okay, currently maybe the Gini is too high, I didn't thereby say that I would like to have a Gini of zero. Likewise, and I use this metaphor of uh, Celsius degrees, it's actually easier with the Celsius degrees. Mm -hmm. you, when I say, okay, it is, you know, too warm today, maybe it's like 35 or 40 degrees, I didn't thereby say that I would like to go to Siberia and have zero degrees. I've said actually that I would like to have maybe five degrees less. And believe it or not, actually the Gini and the Celsius in public perception work quite well because with 25, 30 degrees of Celsius, it is really good Gini coefficient of inequality, just to give people a feeling. When you go with the Gini over 40, like the US and, uh, and China, uh, that's a little bit too hot. And Latin American countries and African countries have Genies of more than 50. I mean, think of the nobody would like to be, you know, 50 degrees Celsius is like, you don't like it. I like the analogy to, to the weather and temperature. I never heard about that. No, I actually use it with my students. I think it's a fairly good analogy. Uh, thing, and you know what? It does really work because the range of Gini coefficient in real world is between 25 and 55. Mm. And it really works. It doesn't, doesn't go below 25, but it's, you, you basically say, okay, they are really good quote, good countries with Gini of 25, 28, 30. And then when you go to 40, it's a little bit too hot. So w what happened in societies where the temperatures are too high? That, what I said before is that really there are societies where we be, I mean, one can reasonably believe that inequality is extremely high and thereby it undermines inequality of opportunity and possibly leads to political whatever, I mean, turbulence or dis disaffection or, or simply the control of the political process by the rich. And then we can go, you know, the very unequal countries are Brazil, South Africa, most of the Central American countries, Colombia. No, it doesn't mean that these countries are horrible, they have not exploded and all that, but it's certainly true that for countries like Brazil, uh, underlying that high number of Gini is a huge inequality in, in racial uh, attainment or ability, so, and likewise in South Africa. And obviously in South Africa, the creation of a new uh, rich uh, black elite, which happened after the end of the apartheid, uh, is also one of the phenomena which are, which are linked with that high inequality. So, what, what are like, what are the causes, the roots of uh, uh, extreme income inequality? Because, like, I was taught, like, uh, Germany, for example, is a meritocracy. No, meritocracy. Meritocracy. You know, when you work hard, you make more money than if you work less. So. If there is income inequality, that means those who make more just work more, Branco, and those who make less uh, work less. But you just said like five minutes ago that actually lots of uh, whatever, 70% of wealth in Germany is inherited. Right. So it's... It's neither one Germans or the other. Germans don't know that. Germans <laughs> don't know that. But it's neither one or the other. So it's actually, obviously, a huge amount, as you said. Technically, we can show. And I, it was recently at a conference in Berlin that they have set up now a new, new unit to study wealth inequality in Germany. Uh, lots of that is inherited. But, of course, there is also a meritocratic element. But one cannot just pull one element and say, okay, there was a guy who worked, you know, 10 hours a day, another one works five, you should have twice as much. Okay, fine, I agree with that. But that's not the only element. There are other ways to acquire wealth. And uh, the other one is, of course, you know, it's inheritance, is also stealing, is using political connections to get ahead. It's actually, you know, many other ways to get it. So we cannot just say 
if there is a certain amount of wealth which is acquired through competition and hard work, yes, that's good, but it's not 100%. So, uh, what can be done ag well, against extreme income inequality? Well, what can be done, we have already agreed before that actually something could be done on climate change. So I think that, I think we have agreed. Uh, on inequality, I think there are many things that could be done. Um, we, we spoke, well, I mean, spoke of in inheritance taxation, which is very significant because it has impact not only now, but it has impact, impact on the, in the future. Uh, we now are talking, which I think is a good idea, of the 2% wealth tax, mm. which would be across countries. It's, uh, it's uh, something which I have to say that five years ago, I didn't think that it was at all likely, but you know, I've, sometimes I'm wrong. Uh, it seems now to be politically becoming, politically sort of considered. Uh, so that can be done, and I mean, it's nothing new, right? I mean, there, there, no. there, there've been wealth taxes before. I mean, you live in the U.S. right, uh, yes, right yeah, now. Yeah. There've been, in, what I think, income tax like until ninety percent or something under, under Eisenhower. Oh yeah, I actually didn't want you know. Oh. Yes, and on top of that, there are income taxes, but oh. there are of course wealth taxes, okay. and they, the, the idea of this two percent wealth tax would be that it would be globally on. Glo I mean, I'm imposed by probably all OECD countries. Yeah. So you would not be able to kind of escape from that unless you want to go to a non-OECD country. Uh, but on, yes, on income taxation, yes, there were very high tax rates and they have gradually been uh, brought down. Uh, uh, so yes, that's true. You could actually, for very, very high incomes, you could uh, impose uh, taxes that, that used to go up to 90%. Marginal tax rate, obviously. Mm -hmm. So it's income above, let's suppose, 1 million euro or 2 million euro or something like that would be taxed very heavily. So why did Western countries in the past uh, tax their rich oh. income, uh, the people with with a high income, much more than now? And yeah, what, what made them change? Well, like, you did, did the rich did the rich lobby against it? Well, it's a very difficult question. I, I really, it's very difficult. People have written books on that. But there was a change in the in the 1970s with Reagan Thatcher revolution. There was this belief that the welfare state has become too big, too inefficient. There is too much spending. That there is not enough incentives to actually work hard, to invest, and so on. So that sort of started as an ideological change. It was transformed into a uh, change, especially, I think, on reduction of taxation that was there, but not so much of spending. When you look actually at Western countries spending as a share of GDP, it did not really go down as, you know, neoliberals said it would, but it was compensated through, uh, especially in the U.S., through, through greater borrowing. So to, you know, if I want to simplify it, for the U.S. case, I would say um, taxation became politically, increased taxation became politically unacceptable. Uh, people, and more recently, uh, uh, Clinton, for example, reduced taxes. Obama increased a little bit, then Trump reduced that, and then Biden remained at that lower level. So it became politically not good to tax. And on the other hand, spending really as a share of GDP did not change, but the gap between the two <coughs> was bridged by greater government uh, borrowing. And one should realize that also uh, uh, borrowing by government is borrowing from the rich people who are then receiving themselves or their children receiving interest from <coughs> from that, from the bonds, yeah. so it's not a neutral stuff. It's not when people kind of think, okay, well, it's borrowing now, so next generation will have to pay. It's not true. It's actually the next generation kids who don't have parents who have left them government bonds. Yes, they would pay, right. but kids who have government bonds would receive money. So th th there used to be a thing. Let's call it progressive taxation, like. Uh, the more you uh, the more you make yeah. the more you pay so in, in the end if you make millions of euros you pay like in the 60s 70s 90% right. uh, on your income uh, and nowadays there's 
there seems to be a cap at least i don't know about the us but in germany is like it, it doesn't matter if you make ten uh, thousand euros a month or a million euros a month you pay uh, the same amount the the, the, the same, same the, the same tax rate was that uh, like was it a plan like uh... you know there is still progressivity in taxation you know i i don't i think maybe the german system is a little bit more progressive than the us there are measurements of that it's essentially it's uh, uh, You look at how much the tax rate, marginal tax rate, goes up, and with what, with amount of of money that you're making. So progressivity is still there. You know, right. only a few countries, like Estonia, I think, actually have flat tax rate, which means that you pay I don't know what they have, 16 percent or something, for everybody. Right. Uh, but normally countries have progressive tax rate, which means that it goes up as your the rate goes up as your salary or income goes up but it could be and i really don't know that for sure but it could be that uh, progressivity has become less compared to the 1970s and certainly the very top rates have been reduced for maybe the reasons ideological reasons that i mentioned before but also possibly and i'm just guessing that i don't know uh, because of tax um, competition between the countries so in other words uh, they would lose uh, these rich people they would go to a different country so then different country they would reduce the tax rates i think in europe that was the issue with the netherlands um uh with that uh, that uh, sort of was considered to have been uh, sort of given preferential treatments or not taxing and then you would lose maybe Germans they would just move there or move to Austria or so on why do nation state um, why, why do they uh, make that possible for the rich to just change where they want to be taxed well <laughs> I mean like Germany could like I don't know it's probably illegal right now but maybe they can make it legal like it doesn't matter if you go to Liechtenstein or Switzerland yeah. or the Bahamas you're German so you pay uh, your taxes here yeah I don't know the exact rules I know that in the, in the in the US case actually that you pay wherever you are yeah. so you as a citizen you pay uh, and even as a green card holder you still pay Uh, so I don't know how are the the German rules, but it's not like that here. Like they, many rich Germans, especially like sportsmen or something, they just move to Monaco or Switzerland. Yeah, Monaco is very popular among. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, it was uh, the the Swedish tennis player Bjorn Borg, uh -huh. and he didn't want to be to be taxed in Sweden. He just moved his tax residence to the. To, to Mon Monaco. Uh, I, yeah. Why is that legal? Why, why do the states or the nation states let that happen? I, I think it. I think on that it would become a little bit better because the, all the rich have attracted too much attention with their ability to essentially play what they call it uh, different tax jurisdictions. That's mm -hmm. actually a very nice expression. You don't say I'm going to go to such and such country in the Caribbean because I won't, don't want to pay taxes. You talk about you know, optimizing tax jurisdictions. <laughs> But I think there will be a crackdown because large, big, important countries like France and Germany, what I understand, are losing quite a lot of money. And they would actually, uh, if big countries decide they want to crack down on that, they would crack down on that. But why haven't they decided yet? Because maybe... They maybe need the money. Maybe that the rich have some influence on the political process. Really? <laughs> some, some people say that. I have my doubts about it. Um, do the rich care about inequality? I mean, I see a lot of rich people who are like, oh, I want, I want, we have to take care of the poor. Uh, poverty is an issue for us, and I want to be seen and heard. Uh, when it comes to poverty, we have to fight poverty. But I rarely hear them talking about inequality. Oh, you're totally right. I, you know, I give you my own uh, sort of, since there was lots of autobiographical stuff in our conversation today, I worked for a, a, a couple of years, exactly, uh, for a U.S. think tank in Washington. 
and they were very nice people and I loved, uh, liked very much the, the, the head of the think tank. And she told me when, uh, you know, you had, she had CVs of everybody who was employed there and so on. And then she would go and talk to the donors because they depended on quite a lot of money from donors. And not really jokingly, but somewhat jokingly, she says to me, look, like I looked at your papers, what you write, and you have too many papers with titles about inequality. Uh -huh. And that was around year 2000. It was 2005, I believe. She says, look, just change all of that stuff and just call it poverty. Because uh, we have rich guys, and it was, she was totally right. She said, you know, the rich guys love to see that we are working on poverty because they give us money and it makes them feel good. But if you tell them we are working on inequality, they think, oh, you're after my money. You want to tax me more. You want me to feel guilty for that money. And I'm against it. And they don't even like the term inequality. What? They don't like the term. You know, the World Bank did not have a unit, which we, I, I worked in that unit. Uh, we had a unit which was called poverty. And then we started working more in inequality. And they didn't want to name the unit for a while the, to call it poverty and inequality unit. They called it poverty and equity. And you know, it is really a contradiction because if we, we should then call it, I said we should call it wealth and equity. Because if we want to take positive terms, you should actually have a positive. But we are working on poverty and inequality. But even the term of inequality was very resented. People didn't like the term. Do they like it by now? Well, they are the very right-wing people, you know, they still don't like it. And even the way that they pronounce it in English, they often say, it's like, like a dirty word. They actually keep, uh, say it in two. They say, it, oh, you study inequality. <laughs> they, they don't put it in a single word. It's just very difficult to, to pronounce. <laughs> Does inequality have anything to do with the rise of the far-right uh, parties in the West? Okay, I have not studied that. I actually we talked about today at the conference a uh, uh, general sort of approach is yes because uh, high inequality meant that lots of uh, different groups were left out that uh, they could not. Uh, and I think especially the the financial crisis actually showed that many of the, what is called middle class basically they had an increase in consumption which was fueled by by household debt mm -hmm. and then uh, the crisis revealed uh, high inequality and that high inequality then sort of fueled the right wing what is called populism I, I don't know you know this is a plausible narrative I, I don't think it's a full story I actually would have all incentive to claim that it's a full story because I work on inequality so it would become more important, but I think that there are other elements. I think there is element of immigration in Europe and now in the U.S. as well. I think there is an element of cultural, uh, how should I say, uh, maybe sn snobbery or, or elitistic behavior that other people don't like. Mm -hmm. So I think there are lots of elements there. So I would not, I'm not sure that we can just single out inequality. I, I do believe that it is one of the elements, but whether it was the only element that I don't think so. But I can like, as a layman, I can imagine that like, when it comes to in income inequality, even immigration, that in the end, like individuals, like people compare themselves uh, to other people. And if, if they see like, oh, there are a few who get richer and richer and richer, and we, we, don't, we don't make more money, you, you inherently find it unfair and not just. And even if there are like immigrants yeah. coming and, and you see like, oh, they haven't worked here at all. I mean, they, maybe they need help, but they have never worked here and they get the same amount of money, even if that's not true, but they, they, they feel like they get the same uh, amount of money and housing that uh, for doing basically nothing. Um, they already compare themselves again and uh, find it inherently unfair. And then there's, there's, there's a growing anger. 
I, I think so. That's why I say uh, that uh, just saying inequality is not sufficient. That inequality was also brought up by globalization, because certainly the deindustrialization of large parts of Europe is linked to globalization and to the fact that you can produce the same things much more cheaply in poor countries. You know, if, if you just look, for example, at clothing, maybe it's like an ordinary case, but just look who is producing the countries. This says made in. You say made in Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, obviously not China anymore, but it many things were produced in uh, rich people who actually own shares in companies would actually find labor much cheaper elsewhere. So part of that explanation for the increased inequality is also linked to globalization and ironically it's also linked to the improvement in the position not ironically but by by fact uh, linked to the improvement of the position of many people in countries like india and china and this is like huge numbers of people so we have to keep this in mind however just go back to what i said before i don't think that putting the entire uh, importance of the rise for the right-wing populist parties of inequality is right because there were other elements you mentioned that one there was an element of fairness there was an element that actually today somebody was mentioning that about three quarters of all unemployment benefits in the netherlands are received uh, and i think high percentage in germany uh received by people who were not born originally dutch mm -hmm. so there is a there is this issue that some people believe that there is unfairness that you just show up from somewhere else and suddenly you have the right to social benefits and um, you live at the same level like other people who have contributed to the social benefits. I didn't mean that it's the only cause for the for the foul, right? But one one of the important yes. causes, because like I see it in my own, uh, like with friends and family, like for like two decades now, like they... Every day you read, or every week, or every month you read in a newspaper or on news. Oh, the the, the country is doing better. We, we the the economy is growing. We're doing better and better and better. Every year, there's the the economy is growing, and the people, like the individuals, feel like, oh, I don't make me, I don't make more money. Uh, where 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 is that where is that money going? Yeah, I, I you know that's an issue, of course, of perception and of course. Uh, From the uh, let me just say, like within totally within income distribution studies, mm -hmm. what the reporting in what the reporting does, the reporting is always reporting about the mean. When you say the GDP has increased by two percent, what we really mean, uh, what it signifies, is that the mean value has gone up by two percent. Now it could very easily happen that the median has not grown at all. So the median, uh, the median growth, if it is your uh, sort of uh, comparator, that the median has at zero, and maybe what went up by uh, by a lot to drive the three percent up is that the top grew up at grew at six percent. So you know, when we speak of these average values, we are thereby um, summarizing lots of information which comes which is in principle coming from everybody into a number. And that number may be biased. And I mean, the, the, the perception of an individual or many individuals may be different from that average number. Uh, but on top of that, there is, as I mentioned, I think we should, uh, it's not my area at all, but I think we should face the, the problem of immigration or, or the perception of some benefits that are unfairly, according to some, unfairly received by migrants. If, we, if one does not uh, even mention that, I think one opens the way for, for very nasty interpretations of that. I, I learned once, like, if people have enough to live by then they're they the 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 chance of comparing themselves with others and uh, to people and lower classes the the risk is lower because they're like they have enough or like when when you want to fight corruption in the uh, in the state you make sure to give the the people who work for you in the state enough money so they don't uh, get the steal. idea of steal stealing Yes, I, I agree. Actually, obviously, if you are well off, you are less likely to pay too much attention to maybe migrants or others. 
on top of that, there is also another fact: is that uh, that uh, well-off people have even an incentive to have more mi more migrants because they can, uh, for employers, they actually cheap labor, give them right? uh, yes, uh, give them actually cheap. I mean, they become cheap labor, and so they they do have that incentive as well. Uh, but uh, but it's also true that, uh, that when you define what is sufficient income, it's very difficult, you know. There is certain level that, of course, you can say, okay, I, I don't, you know, don't sort of look very much at what other people have, but, you know, people compare themselves to, to others. Uh, and uh, I think that even in Europe uh, it is more difficult because European entire history is a history of emigration, of people leaving. They started leaving with obviously start in a more recent period with the Spaniards who went to the Americas and the Portuguese later, but then the English, and then of course large immigrations that from all parts of Europe into the United States, into Canada, uh, South America, and so on. So Europeans were a continent of immigrants and now for the first time they have a very large immigrants from africa middle east and uh, so it was it's um, it, it's, a, it's a change you know i think it's easier for i think i believe it's easier for americans to deal with that so uh in preparation for the interview i learned that you have you have a lot to do with elephants <laughs> Yes. Uh, did you also study zoology? Or w w what is with you and elephants? <laughs> the, the, the elephant chart that you refer to is a chart that I did with um, uh, Christoph Lackner, who is actually a German economist at the World Bank. He was... Uh, uh, he is and he, well, young. He's still in the World Bank. And uh, we did that chart uh, showing at the global level that if you look at... In those days, it was like period 1988 to approximately 2008. That if you look uh, globally and put everybody from the poorest people in the world to the richest, the main gains in percentage terms were realized among the middle group, which actually in the worldwide happens to be mostly in China, and by the top 1%. And the lowest gains close to zero basically were realized among the people who were middle class in rich countries so that's why the elephant uh, the, uh, the, so the chart goes like this and then somebody i don't remember who it was somebody on the on the internet kind of superimposed it on an elephant and uh, called it the elephant chart and you can actually quite well see if the elephant keeps his trunk up like that that it does look like an elephant but only with the trunk like this and that's what became the elephant chart and it became quite popular because essentially it showed um, very unequal gains among uh, uh, population of the rich countries. So why did people in China gain and the very, very rich on top gain so much compared to others? That was exactly the main point of the chart. And also to some extent it highlighted Actually, it was mostly used for that purpose. It highlighted really the political choice of the governments in rich countries. So one political choice, if you want really to push up the, the middle in your country, the, the choice is either we do something with globalization, which then essentially means what we're seeing now, anti-China policies, or we do something with our domestic rich, sort of transfer money from them to give to the middle class. So it was a political choice. So that's why it became very popular. What do, what do you make of the anti-China policies these days? I'm anti-China, anti-anti-China policy. I, I believe that it's a, it's a wrong policy. I think it's a, uh, uh, interestingly. I think it is driven not by the elephant chart because. Uh, the rich, especially I think in the U.S., do control the political process. It was driven now by uh, strategic uh, sort of considerations, by the U.S. decision not to allow China to become a global competitor in, in terms of hegemonic competition. So it is uh, the policies, increased tariff rates, 
the listing of Chinese companies, reduction, severe control of technological exports. Uh, I think are all uh, driven by political reasons and not by maybe some may be driven by by economic reasons, but most of them I think is by political. So like the US likes to have uh, a Chinese market where people can buy American uh, goods, but they don't want them to be too rich. So as in the China overtakes the US as in like an economic power. Yeah, I think it's basically that, you know, it's basically uh, stopping the or not stopping, slowing down the rise of China. Uh, I did an interesting article where I asked the following question, because when you say, okay, how do we measure, you know, China versus the U.S.? One way you can say, okay, look at the GDP per capita in so-called purchasing power terms, which means that you value everything at the same prices. Now, if you do that, China has already overtaken the United States. But if you do it at the market exchange rates, China is, I think, 40% below the United States. If you compare on per capita income, China is like one third of the United States. So it's really quite far. But one thing that I looked, which I had, I mean, I had the data and I found this interesting to ask the following question. When will China have as many people who are above certain income level, relatively high income level, which I took the U.S. media, as many such people as the United States? It's an interesting question because China has currently many fewer of such people compared to the U.S., but it's a big country, right? So the answer is that if China continues growing by two, continues growing by 2% faster than the US. So just I'm looking at the differential in growth. In 30 years, 30, 30 years, China would have as many such rich people as the United States. But if you That's where I think interesting to look at U.S. policies. If you have policies which are both bad for the United States and bad for China, but a little bit worse for China than for the United States, you slow down the catch-up. And for each half a percentage point, you get four years. So if your objective is to make China be slowed down, then you have this really bizarre situation that you might prefer policies that are bad for you so long as they're even worse for the other side. And that's what used to be called beggar thy neighbor, is actually let's screw the other guy even if I get screwed myself, but he will get screwed more. And that's where I think actually U.S. policies now are. Because they are not good for the for the U.S., I, I think, but but they are certainly worse for China. Do you, do you think they will reverse it at some point, or could it get worse? It's hard to say they would reverse it. Actually, there was quite a discussion of among people who know that much better than I. But I think that was a continuation of Trump. You know, Trump was the first one to increase tariff rates of Chinese goods, and then he tried to negotiate that China should import more of, you know, Boeing airplanes and soya beans and so on. But it has continued under Biden, and it, it has become, in some ways, I think, stronger now because there is a strong ideological element as well. You know, Trump had no ideology, I believe. He just was, uh, didn't like Chinese exports. Uh, but uh, I think it is now more ingrained and it's, uh, there is a stronger consensus on this anti-China policy, which goes across uh, Democrats and Republicans. So Branko, like we we said, we're gonna do two yes. hours. Um, we have done more. Let, let's let's finish up. I have a few questions left, okay. and you gotta be come come back on the show at some point. I was I was wondering what role does greed play in your your uh, profession, like or, or in your income uh, in your income equality. You know, obviously we don't have numbers for greed, but I think it does play, this is obviously an observation, not not uh, not something that I can show. Uh, I think uh, uh, <laughs> greed is essentially, I think, the extension of self-interest. Self-interest is good, and it was, it's, 
sort of acceptable that people should be motivated by self-interest. The question is when does when do believe that self-interest becomes greed in the sense that it is overdone. Now, we can actually argue that it is not acceptable what I just was saying, that you uh, sort of make a policy or do certain things based on the fact that it is going to be worse for somebody else, even if it's worse for you. I think this double a loss is, uh, we would all agree, I think most of us would agree that it's not, uh, that this is not good. But let's suppose, but greed is a little bit different because it could be still, let's suppose I'm not doing anything bad to you, but I have an appetite which is, uh, uh, which becomes uh, extravagant. Uh, and uh, then I think greed becomes, uh, greed becomes uh, a vice. When, when you're greedy, there's never an enough. You always want more and more and more. Yes, when you, there, there is no end to that, actually. Exactly. The greed has no... Um, um, I think Marx had a nice uh, uh, description of it. It is of all... Uh, uh, what did they call it? It's abstract... It's, um, uh, what is this abstract consumption? It's actually greed to some extent. Uh, it, it's uh, different from um, enjoyment or from hedonistic things. Mm -hmm. Hedonistic things have a certain logic in the sense that you want to have, in econ economic terms, greater utility. But uh, greed, uh, in extreme form, is not a search for utility. It's a search for utility in the object that you control. In other words, uh, if if I amass millions of dollars on my account, I'm it's it's a very sort of abstract thing, and uh, I think this is the worst part of greed is the um, this uh, 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 that becomes I think pathological and it, it it is a vice. I mean Bernie Sanders was on the show as well. Um, he's famous for saying billionaires should not exist. Do you agree? Yes, I think actually you could easily, you know, you can basically have a have a maximum amount and and then tax it all over after that. Yes, you could do that. So it, it can be done, but do you think it ever will be done? It can be done. There are, of course, uh, some technical issues with it. For example, remember when when uh, Musk, uh, he's now I don't know two hundred fifty billion or something, but then he lost at one point. Uh, he was at one point, if you look at actually capital losses, he was the in that year the most unfortunate man on the planet because he had minus four billion. Yeah. yeah. So the issue is what happens when you have fluctuations. But uh, in, in principle, yes, I think that there are certain amounts that uh, that should be that should not be allowed. Um. How did you end up in the U.S.? I mean, you're, uh, are you still a professor, an active professor? Uh, I'm still, uh, well, my title is now technically a research professor, which means that I can teach practically when I want. I've been... I mean, why, why are you retired? You're 70 years old, like mm -hmm. in Germany. Uh, you would be somewhere in Mallorca or something and just uh, enjoying life. Why, why are you still active? Because I would be bored, actually. Oh. I would be bored. I mean, I, I, I would like to go for three days to Mallorca, but I don't know what I would do on day number four. Uh, the same as you did on day two or something? Yes, but, uh, I, you know, this, this is like, uh, you know, the first day is the best, okay? The second day is still good. The third day is right. good. Actually, to be quite honest, after one week, I get, I get bored. So, I, I, yeah, one week is, 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 is plenty. Uh, I just remember, I think that Marx called it abstract hedonism, or something like that, because it's abstract, but hedonism is concrete, mm. but greed is an abstract hedonism. I think this was the term that he used in Grundrisse. Yeah, so anyway, so that's the answer to your question. So, so, you, so you were working for the World Bank for 20 years. How did... Uh, how and why did you end up at a, an American university? Well, when I was in the World Bank, I worked in the research department. So I had quite a lot of academic contacts. And my work was already then, as I mentioned, 99, beginning of global inequality. And uh, really, like 90 
99% of my contacts were with the academic world and lots of them with political philosophers because they were the only ones interested in that topic then. Even economists were not interested. So then I was, I was teaching uh, part-time at different universities. So I, leaving the World Bank was not... Uh, you know, the question was actually when, and and it it was not like finally one day. Is I you know I went and took leave. You know I mentioned to you the th think tank, and I was teaching in Spain, and I was it was also in England. Mm -hmm. So it was gradual. Uh, it's like you know, when you divorce, you don't necessarily like break it in one day. You just uh, move to a different apartment and, and a different one. And the, so that's how I ended with the World Bank. So when, when you're a research professor now, yeah. uh, do you still have contact to your, to your students? Yeah, I actually, that was my own decision. I think it's useful for me to teach a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm teaching one class per year. I will be teaching this fall. Uh, it's useful for you to, you know, to update your syllabus, to actually have some order and to have to do something. Um, uh, so, yes, I'm still teaching uh, and I find that teaching one class per year really not, not very demanding. We, we haven't mentioned your university. Uh, it's actually gra it's called Graduate Center because it only does graduate studies mm -hmm. at the City University of New York. Now, City University of New York is a state university uh, and it's very large and it's like 250,000 people uh, students or more and they are on different campuses in New York so it's not like the typical American university which is like you know the large uh, loan and uh, very rich it's actually not rich at all because it is state funded and uh, it is in buildings which are essentially in different parts. So you have like a, 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 a city college, you have a, a, a college in Brooklyn. So you are actually part of the of New York. Are there any protests going on these days? They were protests. I mean, at at my own place, there were protests even before the big process started at Columbia and uh, City College actually was one that was with Columbia linked uh, and City College is part of the City University of New York. Um, uh, so there were small protests. We are on the Fifth Avenue, so they were not allowed to be on the street. So the police would cordon them off. The new school for social research is like n not far from, from the from the City University of New York and they had bigger protests and then had an encampment. Did you, did you call the police on them? Uh, no, I didn't call the police on them. I think it was a wrong move to have called the police. And uh, you're also a US citizen, right? You're Serbian and American? I actually have the US green card. Oh, so you're not allowed to vote in the next election? Uh, no, no. Okay, I was gonna ask like if you're, if you can imagine who would you vote for? I, I probably wouldn't vote for anybody. Really? Mm. Even when it comes down to Biden and Trump? I probably wouldn't vote. Interesting. Do you vote in Serbia? Other elections? I stopped. In Serbia? I, I, you, uh, vote, voted once or twice, but then I stopped. You don't vote anymore at all? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, final question. I was going to quote Bertolt Brecht. I don't know. You know yeah. Bertolt Brecht? A great, I, I actually went to, to, to his apartment many years ago, which was just on the, on the river. Right. Yeah. Yes, there's a famous saying, uh, wärst du nicht arm, wär ich nicht reich. Uh, if you were not poor, I wouldn't be rich. Uh -huh. Is that, uh, does, does that phrase uh, is, is still ring true today? I didn't know actually that verse, but it does, uh, does ring true actually. It is uh, uh, to some extent, uh, poverty of some is the condition for the wealth of the others. So I don't think, I'm not saying that we should actually look at every wealth as such, but does it form the sort of ideological, poetical sense? Does it make sense? Does it, is it right? I still, yes, I think it, it is still right. So Brecht was uh, right. Marco, thanks so much. That was fun. Uh, enjoy your time in Nauen. We're very close to Berlin. Thank you very much. It was really fun. Actually, I'm very glad that we had such a beautiful day. And I'm also glad that I've now, by now, I've earned my uh, dinner and even my wine. Have I? <laughs>
<laughs> thanks, Branko. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Bye bye.